I'm a postdoc at the Epic Patrick Institute in the University of Cape Town. And uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce you to uh, Francisco Jose Maldonado, uh, Pepe, Pepe Maldonado, uh, who is also a postdoc at, at the University of Cape Town, but in the um, cosmology and gravity group. And he's also affiliated um, at the other side of the world in the University of Oslo. Um, he, he's, where, where he studied also, um, a, yeah, what, what is the theoretical astrophysics. Um, so yeah, he's a short, uh, um, young researcher and he's got a, a very impressive career so long with nine papers. Uh, he graduated with a PhD last year. That's pretty impressive. Okay. And he's going to uh, yeah, help us understand the universe a little bit better today, uh, not in one way, but in two different ways. But before that, uh, we've got a few words from our ambassador and sponsor, uh, Don Carlos Enrique Fernandez Arias. And um, yes, a couple of also um, uh, housekeeping rules. The chat, uh, the, the talk will be 45 minutes long, more or less, and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions. And if you have any questions during the talk, then you can you can use the Q and A um, button there at the bottom of the screen, and I will also check the chat. Okay. So without further delay, I'm going to um, give way to the ambassador, and then we can we can listen to that. Welcome to. Sorry, I just need to record the talk. I knew I was going to forget about this. <laughs> yeah, I'm already and recording, now, so there's there's no problem. So. Okay, Pepe, so whenever you're ready. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for this introduction. And first of all, let me thank the Association of Spanish Researchers for inviting me to give this talk and to the embassy for the support. So let me share my screen. So, okay. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is the current problems that we have in our description of gravitation and cosmology, and how are we trying to ameliorate them. So basically what we do is modify gravity beyond Einstein theory of general relativity to try and solve those issues. So during this talk, um, 
I will try to explain you why this is interesting and how can we modify a theory beyond Einstein theory of general relativity. So first of all, when you have, uh, I don't know if it's passing, yeah. <laughs> when you have an strange measure in, in your theory that you cannot explain with your current model, you have two options. Either you can assume that there is some unknown matter uh, that it's affecting that measure, or you can assume that the theory is incomplete because it is no longer validated by experimentation. Both of these approaches are correct and completely valid. You just need to prove which one is correct in each case. And there is actually very nice example of both approaches in the history of gravitation itself and how general relativity became to be our current description of gravitation. So to explain that, let me go back a little bit in time to the beginning of the 19th century when only seven planets were known. Even so, in the 19th century, we already had like very precise measures on the orbit of planets and um, the position, velocity, etc. So Le Verrier, a French mathematician, uh, did some tables with all the data that we have from those planets and try to see if the Newton's law of gravitation worked on them. And he found a very strange behavior in the orbit of Uranus because it, with the planets that we knew we have by then and applying the Newton's law, Uranus shouldn't follow that orbit. But the thing is that he realized that he could add another planet and predict with the equation its mass and position, and then the orbit would be completely fine. So that's how he predicted a new planet with Newton's law. So he contacted a German astronomer, Johann Gall, saying that he had to point his telescope in that direction because he would find a new planet. And Probably he was very excited by this because he went out like the very same evening the letter from La Verrera arrived. So, and he did, he discovered Neptune that very first night. I think that's amazing that, okay, we already know that Newton's law is not the current description of gravitation, but it has allowed us to discover new planets just by its mathematical form. But sadly, or not too sadly, <laughs> this is not the end of the story because Le Verrier also found some other weird behaviors. Uh, for example, the precession of the perihelium of the orbit of Mercury. And what's that? That's basically what, what you see in the picture, that the orbit is um, moving each year a little bit to the side. Let's say, uh, okay, this is overly exaggerated because actually it moves um, 38 seconds per century. It's not <laughs> like so exaggerated, but, but you get the idea. So inspired by the success that he had by predicting Neptune, he proposed another planet that would be placed between Mercury and the sun that he called Vulcan. And of course, many astronomers wanted to be like Johann Gall and, and discover its own planet. And they claimed that they have observed this new planet transiting the sun. Um, but no, <laughs> all of those uh, predictions were wrong and all the observations were wrong also. And actually Newcomb, another scientist gave some arguments to discard this explanation of a new planet because having a planet placed between Mercury and the Sun would affect other measures that we already knew that they are okay. That's what we measure. So the Pandora, op the Pandora box opened for the other approach that we can follow. That is that the theory is incomplete and we need to modify it somehow. So during the end of the 19th century, 
there were many theoretical scientists proposing modifications to Newton's law that you know from school that it's basically the um, the constant of gravitation G um, plus the masses of the two bodies involved divided by the radius squared. So what modifications were they proposing? There was one by Hal that he proposed to change the exponent of the of this law to be like two point and a lot of zeros and a seven. Uh, and then yeah, could, you could explain the precession of mercury, but then a lot of other measures were wrong. So, so you cannot do that. Also, electromagnetism was a big thing at the time. So people starting working out like electromagnetism inspired uh, gravitational models, something like that, that add extra terms to this equation, but, but that didn't work also there. I mean, they were very strange proposals at the time, <laughs> but it was not till Einstein theory of general relativity that this precession could be explained and is still being consistent with the rest of measures that we have in the solar system. And the theory of general relativity consists in considering gravity not as a force, but as a consequence of the curvature of our space-time that is provoked by the energy and matter content. You can see this in the Einstein field equations, but basically, these terms here on the left, the R and the G, represents quantities that are related to that curvature on the space-time. And this T mu nu that you see here accounts for the energy and the content. So you have a relation between the curvature of the space-time and the energy and the content. So now you can be asking yourselves, how can curvature describe a force. Like, like. So I will um, give you a very illustrative example that actually is what taught to me by my general relativity professor to, to understand better how general relativity works. So imagine you have two planes in the equator of the Earth going to the North Pole, okay? They just go in a straight line towards the North Pole. And when they're reaching that point, they are going to begin communicating with each other saying, hey, you're coming towards me. Stop coming towards me because we're gonna crash. And the other one is going to say, I'm not coming towards you, I'm just going straight ahead. And the other one would say, no, I'm the one going straight ahead, <laughs> stop coming towards me, right? But they can keep arguing, but if some of the two doesn't move the plane, they're gonna crash. So they are actually feeling an attractive force between the two, but there is no force. It's just the curvature of the sphere acting as a force. So that's how gravity works. And yeah, you, you can think of other examples and also you can have like a like some well and you go into the well like probably in in many science uh, museums you have seen like this uh, thing when you throw a ball and you can see rotating and that's also like a very nice example but I, <laughs> but I really like this one with the place <laughs> so yeah Still, this is not the end of the story. If not, I would not be working in <laughs> modified theories of gravitation. Um, because general relativity has some issues also. And one of the most remarkable ones are the accelerated expansion of the universe, the rotation curves of galaxies, and the so-called tensions in our preferred cosmological models. So let me explain these three problems in the following. The first one was measured by Ries in the supernovae collaboration. That basically what they did is to study the intensity of supernovae 
versus the distance. And in that way, you can measure the expansion of the universe. And they measure that the universe is not only expanding, but it's doing it more rapidly at each time. That uh, expansion, it's an accelerated expansion. And why is this a problem? Because that means that at very large scales, gravity is not attractive anymore. Like if gravity is attractive as, at all scales, that acceleration would be decreasing because you are, it is an attractive force. So you cannot be expanding continuously and even more rapidly. So there must be something that it's making gravity being not attractive at large scales. And that's what we call dark energy because the usual approach in gravity at the moment is the first one, assuming there is some unknown matter and energy content that we haven't observed yet that it's affecting these measures. So we can solve this problem of the accelerated expansion by adding what it's called a cosmological constant to the Einstein field equations and also known as dark energy. The other problem that we have is the rotation curves of galaxies. When we measure the velocity of, of the galaxy with respect to the radius, we see that if we have stars and gas, that it's what mm, we usually assume that the galaxy has, it should follow that curve that you see that when it reaches a point, it has a lower and lower velocity. But the thing is that when we measure it, we see that when it reaches that point, actually that velocity is more or less constant. And how do we explain that? We have to add new matter that we haven't observed yet, that it's known as, as dark matter. And that it's located usually at the center of the galaxies and, and then it smears out. You know probably in the next talk that we have by, by Miguel, uh, he will explain more about dark matter and we, how can we try and observe it or whatever. But the thing is that we haven't observed it yet. So we have room still for other um, explanation. The moment we measure dark matter, then we can stop looking for other possible explanations. So if you have accelerated expansion and you have these rotation curves, we have seen that you can explain it adding dark energy and adding dark matter. And with those two explanations, you can build a cosmological model that is basically a model that tells you how the history of the universe is. And it's called Lambda CDM model. Lambda because usually the dark energy is called Lambda and CDM because of cold dark matter. But the thing is that if this model actually works pretty well, I mean, <laughs> we have to admit that. That's why we want to find what dark energy is and there are people looking to observe dark matter in, in telescopes or even in, in accelerators. But the thing is that in the recent years, we have observed what I call tensions between the early universe and the late universe. Especially if you measure the Hubble parameter at the present time, it's called H0, that it's basically a quantity that tells you how the universe is expanding at the present time. So if you measure it with uh, experiments that um, are based on very early measures, like, I don't know, Planck uh, measures the cosmic microwave one ground, that that's the light coming from 
when the universe was only 300,000 years old. So that's a very early universe. And you see that you have a value of 67.4, yeah. And, and in the late universe, you have measures of 70 something. And okay, it, it's uh, normal that with different experiments, you get different values. But the error bars must be compatible. And you see that you have some experiments in the early universe like Planck, and some experiment like uh, this shoe experiment, that they are not compatible at all. Like there's a huge tension between the early and late universe measures. And we don't know how to solve this yet. So this is telling us that it's, I mean, at least it's still a good approach to go beyond general relativity and try to explain this without adding dark matter and dark energy. And that's what we do. We go beyond Einstein theory of general relativity. But how do we do that? We just take like the field equations that I showed you before and just add terms randomly and see what happens. Uh, no, but probably because <laughs> that would not work. But, um, what we need to do is to change the action of a theory. So in order to see what the action of the theory is, let me go back a little bit to classical physics, where the action is defined as a functional from which the trajectory of the particles can be derived. Basically what you do is you use the Hamilton principle that is telling you that if you have a particle, that I'm going to try, right? If you have a particle here at, at the time T1, and then you observe it, I don't know, um, five seconds later in another time, and you want to see which trajectory this did, this particle followed, the Hamilton principle is telling you that it would be the trajectory that minimized the action during that time. And one important property is that the action can be no, always written as the integral of a function that depends on the position and time that it's called, no, on the position and the velocity, sorry, um, that it's called the Lagrangian. And now we go to a simple example that I think it's very useful, that it's a free moving particle. The free moving particle, a particle which has no force acting on it, the action is just the integral between the two times of the kinetic energy. Do you remember this um, kinetic energy probably from high school, like the one half of the mass times the velocity squared. So if we minimize the action to obtain the trajectory of a free moving particles, we have to apply what it's called the Euler-Lagrange equations. If we, we apply them, we arrive at this condition. Basically that the acceleration needs to be zero. If you solve this differential equation, you arrived I probably known by everyone from school also, that it's the rectilinear uniform movement equation. And you know, back there in school, like we were like, but why does, <laughs> does a particle that has no force in it follow a rectilinear uniform movement? So now you know why, because it was minimizing its kinetic energy. It has to follow um, the path that minimizes the energy. I think that's cool that finally this has like some explanation. And so like, no, you need to solve this equation and that's all it's done. I mean, that equation is there for a reason. The thing is that in gravity things complicated a little bit. And, and actually the action doesn't give you the trajectory of the particle, but when you apply the minimal action principle, what you obtain is the field equations that are the equations that relate the curvature with the energy and matter content. In general relativity, the action is 
known as the as, as the Einstein Hilbert action, that it's this one. This um, G is the determinant of the metric that accounts for the curvature of the space time. Um, well, it's related, yeah. Well, <laughs> um, the R is the Ricci scalar that also it's related to the curvature of space time. And, and this L matter is the, the part of the action that it's giving you the matter content that you want to add. So how do we modify this? Well, the thing is that we need to take into account that this is not an arbitrary function, um, yeah, an arbitrary functional. This is actually a very special one because it's the only possible local gravitational action which contains only second derivatives of a single four-dimensional space-time metric. And why it's important to have second derivatives? Because if you have higher than second derivatives, um, things start to get unstable and you don't want instabilities in your theory, as I shall explain later. And this tells us also that this is a very important theorem because it tells us that in order to modify gravity, we need to break one of these conditions. So let's see what we can do. We can, for example, go to extra dimensions, for example, because this theorem is telling us that we are in a four dimensional space time. So we can go to extra dimensions, then we can modify this, this action. We can give up no locality, but then the equations start getting quite messy. So I don't recommend that. Other possibility that you have is to add more fields because in the theorem, you can see that we say that you can only have second derivatives of a single four dimensional metric, but you can have second derivatives of other fields and the theory would be unstable, the, uh, stable, sorry. So we have the possibility of add more fields. So which one? should we should choose along all these? So, well, basically you can do whatever you want, but, <laughs> but you have to make sure that the theory doesn't have instabilities. This is very important because having instability means that if you perturb an stable position, you don't go back to that stable place. Okay, let us make an experiment right now. Probably you are seated at the moment. So if you lift yourself a little bit up and you let go, you go back to your seat position because you are in a stable universe and, <laughs> and you were at an unstable place that it was the chair. So if you do a small perturbation, you go back to that stable place. But in stable theory, if you do that small perturbation, you lift yourself up a little bit. And when you let go, you start rolling down the room and you, <laughs> and you start crashing into things, and <laughs> this kind of stuff. So you don't want that because that's clearly an unphysical behavior. So we have to make sure that our theory doesn't present any instability. Also, it needs, of course, to be compatible with the current experimental measures because it would not be a physical theory <laughs> if that's the case. I mean, you cannot go beyond the experiment in, in, any, in any discipline of science, basically. I mean, we're based on experimental measures. So you have to take that into account. Also, from a theoretical perspective, it is very important that you explain where the breaking of the love lock theorem is coming from. Because if not, you're just parameterizing your ignorance. You're just putting the things we don't know in fancy words, basically. So we don't want that. We want to know where modifi the modification of gravity is coming from. 
So I want to present to you the theory we work with. Um, well, let's start presenting because I'm still <laughs> going to talk a little bit more about more stuff. So in the theory we work with, uh, the extra degrees of freedom that we are introducing these extra fields come from the torsion tensor. And the torsion tensor is the antisymmetric part of the connection. And the connection is basically an operator that it's telling you how to take derivatives in curved space. So it's not something that we don't know what it is. We know it's already present in, in our geometrical description of the universe. But the thing is that in general relativity, we choose a symmetric connection that it's called the Levitch Vita because that's the simplest connection that you can take mathematically, but there is no physical reason to choose the Levitch Vita connection and your preferred affine connection. So there is a room for allowing the torsion tensor to be different from zero. And it's something that it's a property of the space time. So we know where it's coming from. Also, the theory is called Poincaré gauge gravity because of the arguments that we use to construct it. And this is actually crucial because let me talk a little bit about the importance of symmetries in physics because symmetries are the building blocks of all modern physical theories, thanks to the Nether theorem. That it's probably the most beautiful theorem in the history of mathematics, in my opinion that it states that, okay, roughly speaking, for every symmetry of nature, there is a conservation law. And for every conservation law, there is a symmetry. So let us stop a little bit and see the consequences of this. Okay, in high school, they told us all the time that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it only transforms. So they are telling us that the energy is being conserved. There is a conservation law. So that means that thanks to the Nether theorem, we know that there should be a symmetry associated with it. And it is, it is because the laws of nature are the same now that they will be in 1 million years, and they have been the previous uh, million years. Because the laws of nature are invariant under time translations. And that's huge. I mean, the thing, for example, this thing, like the energy must be conserved. This is not a mantra anymore. It's because the laws of nature that we're choosing to describe it, are invariant on time. If they are not invariant on time, that means energy is not conserved. So we have to take that into account. So uh, I want to give you some more examples that it's okay with the invariance and the time translation gives you that the energy is conserved. Also, the, you probably have studied the linear momentum, the mass times the velocity of the particle. And you see that in a free moving particle, the momentum is conserved. So now again, it's not a mantra anymore. It's because the equations that describe the movement of a free moving particle are invariant under space translations. Like if you move your host, I mean, your action doesn't depend on only depends on the velocity, not on the position. And also, if you have a studied angular motion, you know that the angular momentum must be conserved. But there is a reason for that. It's because the equations are invariant under rotations. So let me explain how our current theories are based on symmetries. And it's via the gauge principle. So the previous example that I have 
in K view were global symmetries. Uh, because you are making the same symmetry at each point of the set space time. But if we allow a different value of the transformation at each point, we have a local symmetry. That means that, for example, you don't move mm, your whole experiment two meters away. You move uh, 1.2 meters, 1.1 meter, or 0.1 kilometer, like you can change the value of your transformation at each point. So as you can imagine, in general, the theory that it's invariant under global transformation is not invariant under local ones. So in order to be invariant under local ones, you have to add new fields to obtain that local invariance. And that's uh, the base of the gauge principle that you can see in this picture. If you have a symmetry, we know that via the Nether's theorem, there is a conserved quantity. And if we promote that global symmetry to a local symmetry, we know we have to add new fields in order to make it invariant under that local transformation. And when you do that and add that new fields, you find out that there is an interaction between that conserved quantity and the gauge field that are called. And actually the standard model of particles, I mean the electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force are explained using the gauge principle. And you can build the standard model of particle physics as a gauge theory of the group SU3, SU2, U1. So if it has been so successful with the rest of forces of nature, why not apply it to gravity? So that's what we do. We impose invariance and the local Poincaré transformation, that it's the local Lorentz group, that it's um, the equivalence of the Galileo transformations, but in general, well, in special relativity, and local translations. The gauge fields coming from the Lorentz transformation is the Riemann tensor, but it's a tensor that accounts for the curvature. You have seen it already, the R tensor, but with four indexes. And the translations gives you the torsion tensor. So now, you see where the torsion tensor is coming from. We are not adding just because, oh, in, in a geometrical setup, there's torsion, so we're going to add it and assume it's non-zero. No, it's because we have made this symmetry argument of Poincaré gauge invariance. And the torsion tensor has appeared from this symmetry argument. So if you build the action that is invariant on the local Poincaré transformation, you find this one, uh, that it's uh, composed of the einstein hilder part that you have already seen, that it's, oh, let me draw here, this part you have already seen. You have also terms that are quadratic in the torsion tensor and terms that are quadratic in the Riemann tensor. And well, and the Ricci tensor also, but the Ricci is just a contraction of of the Riemann tensor and also the Ricci scalar square here because it's also a contraction of, of the Riemann tensor. Then. Yeah. So now that I have presented you the theory, let me tell you a little bit about what I have done during my thesis. Just I will mention three works only that I think they're interesting. One of them worries about the stability of the theory. And we found out that not all propagating degrees of freedom that we have in this wonderful <laughs> action um, are unstable. No, only two scalars, only two parameters uh, can propagate without introducing ghosts. The thing is that, well, ghosts are a kind of instability that are basically negative energy particles. And you probably 
can see that if you have particles that have negative energy in your theory, that it's going to give you very unstable situations like the one I told you about the chair before <laughs> and all that. And the thing is that the action, the effective action that you obtain with two scalars has some nice properties that can serve as an effective dark matter and dark energy, but this is still in progress. So um, I can't tell you anything at the moment. I don't <laughs> Another one is that, okay, it's interesting to explore the consequence that this theory is going to have in order to find difference with respect to general relativity. So you can measure this theory, these differences, and prove that this is the correct description. So we studied the Birkhoff theorem, that it's a theorem that holds in general relativity, that it's the unique a spherically symmetric solution in vacuum is this partial metric uh, that is the usual black hole solution. And we found out that the unique stable Poincaré gauge theories that fulfill the Birkhoff theorem are these ones, one with uh, just the Einstein-Hilbert term plus t squared terms, these three t squared terms that you have in the actions, and one that it's uh, basically the Einstein-Hilbert term plus the rich scalar square. And actually, these two theories were known uh, to fulfill the Birkhoff theorem till the 1980s. But in the research article, they just said that, OK, we know these theories fulfill the Birkhoff theorem, but we don't know if they are the unique ones. So what we are saying is that if you take a, theory, a Poincaré gauge theory beyond these two ones, either they are unstable or the Birkhoff theorem doesn't hold, which means that you can have black hole solutions beyond the one in general relativity. So that's also interesting, and it gives us room to find spherically symmetric solutions that are not present in general relativity in vacuum. Another consequence that you can see is that, okay, when you add torsion, that makes the fermions that have sweet particles like electrons, neutrons, neutrinos, protons, also. Um, they move differently to what they do in general relativity. So we made a simulation of the movement of an electron around the black hole. And you can see that there is a difference in time with respect to the movement that it would have in general relativity. So that means that comparing the trajectories of fermions with respect to um, integer spin particles that are called bosons, we can search for, for torsion and the effect on tor of torsion on those trajectories, either to measure it or to set constraints on the value that it can have. So finally, let me talk about some applications because it's usually in in my research talks in <laughs> theoretical physics, I don't talk too much about applications, but I think they are important. So I want to mention them. So the thing is that exploring modifications of general relativity help us understand it better because you can see how hard it is to modify it because in, without incurring in some pathological behavior or you have ghosts and then you cannot explain the measures or you know you are adding two strange terms that are, don't look very physical those kind of stuff yeah, it, it's a very well written action that it's very hard to modify it. So you can see the beauty of general relativity by try and modify it. <laughs> also the mathematical tools that we use uh, can be used in other fields in physics and in science in general, like in, in mathematical modeling 
and and all this kind of stuff like it's it's very useful and also a more pragmatic example of a gravitational theory is that our global positioning system would not work if we did not know about modern gravitational theories such as general relativity because if you use newton law to actually calibrate your gps it would give you like a wrong position that it's uh, five meters away each day so after a few days like uh, <laughs> you cannot locate yourself anymore so we are lost without general relativity and finally some take home message that I want to share. So if you're seeing this in, in YouTube, you can skip the talk and <laughs> go directly to, to this slide. And I can tell you that the accelerated expansion of the universe and the rotation curves of galaxies cannot be explained with general relativity and the standard matter of the standard model of particles you have to add in our current description, dark energy and dark matter. But the thing is that the cosmological model that we build with such dark matter and dark energy suffers from tension. So we can go beyond the relativity and try to modify it, but we need to be careful and take into account the stability of these theories and theoretically justify them. Also, searching for the consequence of these theories, it's interesting because we can find measurable differences with respect to general relativity, and then we can prove if they are the correct description or not. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to, to answer it. Thank you very much, Pepe. That was really fascinating. If anyone has any questions, um, I think you probably have to raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you. Well, well, people think about questions, I actually have. Uh, a handful of questions. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, so there's a bit of a philosophical one. You mentioned that in, in general relativity, gravitation can seem sort of as a curvature of space time. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that the universe is expanding. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that the universe has some sort of curvature of some sort? Uh, yep, yeah. actually, yeah, yeah. It, it has a, uh, the universe has curvature. It's usually described as um, what it's called the friedman lemaitre roberto walker metric. And usually it's flat version, but it's basically you can imagine as a flat sheet that it's expanding on time. You know, you have a flat sheet and this is like this axis is the time. So that sheet is expanding over time. There are also models with a closed universe or open universe, but, but our description is a flat universe at large, large, large scales that over time it's expanding. Okay, thank you. So, see, I don't know if in the chat. Yeah. Um, 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 uh, we've got a couple of questions in the QA. Maybe I can read them for you, Pepe. And yeah, yeah, sure. You can answer them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah, Alberto asked. Based on your background, what do you have to say to people that believe that Earth is flat? That is the first <laughs> part of the question. Well, probably I have to censor myself here. <laughs> um, I don't know. Currently, I don't know what makes 
to then believe that the earth is flat because we don't have any evidence of that and we have evidence of the opposite like we have evidence that that the earth is i mean it's not exactly a sphere but it's more or less sphere like you can do very simple experiments i mean already the greeks and the egyptians made some <laughs> some experiments that proved the curvature of earth so, so and they're actually very simple you just have to stick um to take a stick on the ground and see like the how the sand makes the shadow and then you go a few days later and and see the shadow again and and that can prove it but you you have to move a kilometer away i think i don't know yeah, you can you can do it by by that i will i can give examples on that um also, yeah, I have already the chat here, so I can read the, the other one. Sure. That it's, um, how is your research related with the University of Cape Town and why South Africa? So actually, I mean, in Cape Town, there is one of the best gravitational um, groups in the world that it was founded by George Ellis, which was a student along with Stephen Hawking and, and all this group of um, PhD students of Dennis Shama. I mean, mainly all the, mm, all the PhD students of Dennis Shama are either Nobel Prizes or they, <laughs> they have been very successful in, in gravitational theories. So yeah, actually it is very famous and we have like very good people working on, on the University of Cape Town in gravitation. There is also quite a large telescope in... in um, yeah, the, yeah, they're building the... Uh, probably Miguel is going to talk about it next week. They are building like the SKA telescope, the square kilometer array telescope that it's going to be... Um, well, it's based in South Africa and also in Australia, and it's going to be the biggest radio telescope in, in the world. We've got a we've got a question here in the Q and A uh, section. Um, mm -hmm. Avisek uh, wants to to you if, if you could maybe explain local symmetry further. Um, by symmetry, you mean of states, or what do you mean? Oh, I mean, I mean symmetry of the action, like the transformations that you make to the action that would make it in variance. Like for example, you do like a, um, I don't know, a translational symmetry and you take X and move it like a differential by, by, a, by a very small step, let's say. Um, and yeah, and the thing is that, okay, one second. Um, and the thing is that when you have a local symmetry, that means that that symmetry that you are performing, it's not the same at each point. Like for example, if you have, um, I'm thinking of how you can, I mean, let me, I will try to write on the slide. <laughs> um, here, for example, a rotation, uh, I don't know if, yeah, a rotation in the complex plane, um, but it's in the, in the plane that, is, that you have the complex numbers, for example, if you have a complex number C, then you want to rotate it by this quantity, um, you can express it like this. So if you put it like this, and theta is the same everywhere, this is a global symmetry, because you are, um, you are doing the same rotation everywhere. But if you now do this and assume that theta can depend on the complex number that you apply it, that is a local symmetry because it depends on the point you are applying it. Okay. So is there any more questions? In the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, Yanga has a, a question and also a raised hand. So I don't know if uh, maybe you want to um, ask directly. 
free to, to Pepe and allow you to talk. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just um, uh, um, wondering because I heard a lot about the um, how general relativity is sort of like some sort of uh, geometrical argument for um, for gravity, and mm -hmm. I was cons I was wondering if it, is it possible to explain maybe the acceleration? Has any um, investigation been done into the um, the actual curvature and the, or the geometry of space time to see how it accommodates the acceleration of um, uh, uh, the universe. So maybe if, if you looked at um, space time as some sort of hyperbolic space, does that help? Has that been investigated um, to see how it contributes to the acceleration of the universe? Um. Yeah, they, I mean, actually, all, all the possible geometries in the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Volcker metric that uh, have been explored. That you can have like a flat space like hypersurface, but you can have it hyperbolic, and also you can have it like a closed one. So if you have an hyperbolic one, that it's called an open universe, and if you have um, a closed one, that it's called a closed universe. But actually, the best one that it fits uh, still it's uh, the flat description, and it is true that that in, um, these modifications of geometry have been explored. But still, the one that best fits the data it's the flat one. Oh, okay. So it wouldn't uh, contribute at, at all to explaining the acceleration. That's sort of teaching uh, of the geometry. No, because it that does not fit with with other probes that we have. Like the if you see, like for example, the Planck results, like you can see that the universe is almost flat. Like you can see the okay. this is described by the K parameter of the Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric, and you can see that the K parameter is almost zero by some error bars. But... Okay. All right, thank but you. yeah, it, it has been explored. <laughs> okay. okay, are there any other questions? Okay. Well, um, if there are no other questions, um, I must apologize first because apparently the measure um, wasn't heard. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, it's probably something to do with the with the sharing from my side. And um, mm. and yeah, thank you very much, Pepe. It was really fascinating for the talk. And for the thank you very much and, for inviting me here. Yeah. Sure, and thanks everybody for for 